Uh-oh. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Real Estate Realities with The Rebel Broker. My name's Robert Whitelaw, and I am The Rebel Broker. Licensed real estate broker in the state of California. Member of the National Association of Real Tours. But please, don't hold that against me. Helping folks in Silicon Valley achieve their real estate dreams. If you're interested in buying, selling, or investing in real estate, please feel free to reach out. You can find me at soldbyrobert.com. We've got an interesting show for uh, everyone today. We are going to be interviewing Michael Hellickson, founder and CEO of Club Wealth. Now, that is a group that uh, caters very much towards real estate folks, so it's very much focused on agent things. But I wanted to talk to Michael about buyer, seller, and investor things. I, I wasn't so so we had that chat and i think you'll you'll agree that we covered some interesting topics so without any further ado let's go ahead and jump in and we will kick things off here is the interview with michael hellickson enjoy all right so with us today i have michael hellickson and some of you may know his name because he is not a shrinking violet in the world of real estate um michael is the founder and president ceo of club wealth which is a coaching and consulting firm for real estate agents who want to do better in their in their business and grow. But he's also uh, a top 1% agent, uh, the topic I know we've talked about on the show before. But in terms of just having 20 years of experience doing the job and getting things done. And just before we started recording, I did have a conversation with him about my whole top 1% feeling. So we'll probably let him chime in on that. Um, just because we like to keep it real here. And we like to talk about real things. Uh, but I'd love to hear from the man himself if you want to give us a quick rundown on your entry into real estate and what what yeah. got you here and, and what kept you here. I know I appreciate that a lot. You know, and, and first of all, thank you for having me. And I appreciate you guys listening in. And hopefully we can bring you a ton of value today that uh, that you'll walk away thinking, man, I am glad I listened to that today. Yeah. Um, you know, just by way of credibility uh, for starters. Yeah. You know, we talk about what top 1%. I actually, if you look at per, by transactional count. Uh, I was actually the number one real estate agent. Uh, well, we know for sure in the United States, and we're pretty pretty confident on the planet uh, for quite a while. And uh, you know, just heck, even even over a decade, almost decade and a half ago, we were doing 120 to 180 transactions a month, and had 750 listings in active and pending status at one time. And the, and if you're in real estate, those numbers mean a lot. You know, that you, you look at those and you'd be like, wow, that per they were doing a ton of freaking business. Yeah. But if you're not in real estate. You know, to, to, to Robert's point, you know, we were talking about, you know, well, what about the average sales price to list price? You know, if and and how does you, how do your sales compare to the marketplace? You know, are you getting sellers more money than than the typical agent in the marketplace? And and our average was about one hundred and five percent of list price. We're uh, in, in the in the earlier years, we were about one hundred and three point five percent, and we eventually got to about one hundred five percent of list price as we really dialed it in. And as we were doing more short sales, that had a big impact on that number as well. Yeah. Uh, my son today, uh, so he's twenty years old. He's killing it actually. Uh, is it's insane how well he's doing, how fast, but he's at one hundred and eight percent of list price. Um, which I think current market statistics, you know, or, or, or current market uh, status kind of impacts that as well, or market yeah. conditions impacts that as well. Um, but in terms of, you know, how I started selling real estate and all that kind of stuff, uh, if that's what you were looking for, then ultimately I started selling when I was in high school back in 1991. Uh, so this is my, what, 31st or 32nd year in the industry. So how old were you when you started? I was 18. I was in high school. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah. I was my, the fact, the first sale I ever had was one of my teachers. Uh, I, she listed her house with me and I sold it. It was great. Uh, she was happy. I was certainly happy. I was actually the top agent in my office. Uh, well, I was, I was the top listing agent in my office before I graduated high school, which pissed a lot of people off. It was really, uh, it was it's quite interesting. You know, it's everybody's, everybody's on your side. Everybody wants you to succeed until you do. 
Yeah. Right. And then all of a sudden, when you succeed, they're like, well, wait a minute. Now, how come he's having all this success and I'm not, you know, and yeah. then they get frustrated and they try and drag you back down. But yeah, I didn't hit it quite as young as you. I was the youngest guy in the office when I joined, but I was huh? in my uh, last year of college, I guess, when I when I jumped in. So I would have been about four years older than you. But uh, yeah, 18. That's Even amazing. still, that's fantastic. I, I love young people getting into the business. Love it. I mean, I look at Austin's team. He's 20 years old. Right. And he's he, he, in the last week, in the last eight days, he's listed seven homes just in the last eight wow. days. He's that's 20 weird. years old. He's got an 18 year old on his team. He's got a 21 year old on his team. That's doing very well. He's got a, a 24 year old on his team. That's crushing it. Actually another list. He's a listing agent also doing very well. I think the oldest person on his team that's not in an administrative position is like 30 years old. Uh, so I love seeing these young people and don't get me wrong. There's no, the, the number one agent in the country started when he was 72 so yeah. age is not a factor. I guess that's really the message is that I don't care how old somebody is, if they're going to work their tail off and they're going to, and they're in halfway intelligent, they yeah. can do very well. Yeah. So. Yeah. And you, you'd like to, uh, it's an unfortunate reality though, that you'll find, I have found some of the best agents I've ever encountered really stink at the self-promotion side of things, yeah. right? So that, oh, so yeah. they're great agents and they're great at the job of that, but they're not good on the entrepreneurial self-promotion, realizing that you, you're running your own business oh, yeah. part of it, which is a shame. Well, um, it's a different dynamic and serving and acquiring business are two very different dynamics, yeah. right? Uh, and it, it's like, I always like to say mother Teresa would have made a terrible real estate agent, right? Not because she wouldn't serve at a high level because she would, she'd serve people at the highest level humanly possible. Right. The yeah. problem is somebody has got to do the client acquisition for her because she's not very good. I mean, yeah. not everybody out there is a leper looking to sell their house. Right. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, somebody has got to bring that business in and somebody has got to take really good care of it. But I think we also need to not sell mother Teresa short. She was savage <laughs> by all accounts. So I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure she would have let anything stand in her way one, one way or the that's other true. when she put her mind to it. That's true. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. So <laughs> this is, you know, it's a, the whole behind the scenes inside baseball stuff is great, but I love to keep it focused on my buyers, sellers, yeah. and, and potentially investors. I actually think everyone who buys real estate should put on their investor hat before 100%. they sign anything. Um, you know, just even if they just want to plant to sell their home in 10 years, if you have your investor's hat on, I think you're making better choices. But I, can, yep. can I jump on that real quick, Robert? Yeah, sure. I, I, want, I want to piggyback on that. I, for everybody listening today, whether you're a buyer, a seller, a real estate agent, anybody, doesn't matter. Every single person watching this today, if you want to build wealth in America today, guess what you need to do? You need to invest in real estate. Yeah. It is the one thing guaranteed to, pay, to, to keep pace with and, op, and, and generally uh, outperform inflation. Uh, it's not, so it's not only is it a hedge against inflation, it's the, it's the easiest way to leverage your investment, to make more, you get tax benefits. There's, there's so many ways you make money investing in real estate. I would suggest that if you could set it as a goal to buy one property, even if it was just every three years, if you want to retire wealthy, buy one property every three years. Now, if you want to really go big, buy one each year. Yeah. But everybody's capable of doing that with the with the lending the way it is today and the economy the way it is today. It's possible for everybody in America. And I'll tell you, with with the hedge funds getting into purchasing real estate, I mean, I think 25% of all the sales that have happened in the last 12 months have been Wall Street and yeah. other investors that own already 10 or more properties bought 25% of all the transactions last year. Yeah. That's yeah. a substantial number. And what's happening is real estate shifting. It's still a great opportunity. But in 10 years, it's going to be much harder for the average American to get into a home. Yeah, you know, and on that subject, I mean, this is actually, I've been, I've been working out what my next podcast was going to be down the line. Mm -hmm. And the, what's going on right now with these companies that are doing this level of investing, it's starting to feel an awful lot like, like the securitization of, of loans that was happening in oh, yeah. the early 2000s, where now you've got people's pension funds that are investing in these things that are fully vested in buying all this real estate. So if those things take a hit in some way, you start to see the building blocks of a very similar occurrence to what happened in 2006, seven and eight. Um, so on that subject, one of the areas I, where I know you're an expert is short sales. And in, in terms of, and obviously we can cover as many things as you, as you can in the, in the time you've got for us, but with the benefit of believing it will come rather than we're already here and we're on fire 
what would be some prep things you would say for a potential a person who's in a home who's worried that hey i may my life may be impacted i may have to do a short sale what are things you can prepare today to either completely dodge being in a short sale or to prepare as an investor for an upcoming surge in short sales well let's let's look at the reality of the of the marketplace right now right canada is down 20 percent in the last 60 days 20 percent average sales price is down 20 percent in the last 60 days in canada yeah the u.s when everybody wants to say oh everything's rosy nothing's yet we're not going to see a big foreclosure boom all that kind of stuff whether we do or not it's irrelevant right we can't control that. So all we can do is control the control of this. And so what we have to do as homeowners, and you know, if we're talking specifically to homeowners right now, what I have to do as a homeowner is I have to understand what this looks like long-term. You see, the problem is the people that get bit are the people that have a short-term hardship that then causes them not to be able to make their mortgage payment. Now, if the market has adjusted in the short-term, which by the way, 20% of every home in America had a price reduction in the last 60 days. If it's on the market, 20% of all listings in America reduced their price in the last yep. 60 days. That's substantial. That's something we haven't seen in five years. I mean, and it, that's a massive, and by the way, in terms of the size of that number, it's something we haven't seen since 2007 and eight. And yeah. so, I mean, we're talking massive numbers here. We're now, seeing that here too, right in Silicon Valley. Oh yeah. Oh, Silicon Valley is going to get hit big time. There's yeah. no, and California is always a roller coaster. Uh, and so, yeah, and California is one of the first to get hit, by the way. In fact, I'll tell you San Diego's numbers. I just happen to know them off the top of my head. San Diego in the last 60 days, <laughs> had a 36% increase in inventory and a 6% decrease in demand. Now that may not sound super substantial, but that is massive. Yeah. That is May to May shit. in Silicon Valley, 24% increase in inventory. Dude, I mean, that's huge. It's huge. Those are yeah, big the numbers. The national average is an 11% increase. So no, I'm, I'm telling you guys, as you say, huge. we're leading the uh, yeah. not good run. <laughs> well, but here's the thing. And so, so here's what you guys, like I'm buying investment properties right now. Like I've got five that I'm, I've got under contract literally right now today, I, this month, we're, we're hoping to close on five more. Yeah. I know I'm probably buying at the peak of the market, but I'm not buying short term. I'm not, I don't flip properties. I buy and hold long term. Furthermore, I'm not banking on appreciation. I'm getting it for cash flow. I buy my properties for cash flow and only for cash flow. If it's not going to cash flow, I don't buy it. When's the last time rents went down? Yeah. Anywhere. But let's pause right there for a second because I think that's a crucial one, right? So you're in contract, five different properties. It's a math problem at that point. It is okay. not a, I love the color or whatever. It is. I haven't even seen them. Yeah, it's it's that's a little nuts to me, but, oh, but. No, they're, they're, I've got I've got I've got I've got them in Chicago, I've got them in Florida, I've got Kentucky, I've got Wisconsin, I've got them all over the country, uh, it's, and I don't I don't see any of these things. There's people for that. I got inspectors for that. I got agents for that. I got people yeah. that take care of all that for me. So what are you doing in terms of the math? On the math side, I like to encourage my investor clients to, if they're worried about the future, just mm -hmm. say, well, I won't buy a home unless it's got this amount of buffer on my profit and loss. Right. right. So for me, it's so, very simple. For me, number one, it's got to it's got to conform to several things. One, it's got to conform to the one percent rule. If I buy for a half yeah. million, I got to get five five thousand dollars a month in rent. Now, after do, putting twenty percent down, I got to know with a twenty percent down investment that I've got a twenty five percent margin from payment to rent. Uh, and as long as those numbers match up, I'm good. I'm solid, and and I can choose. Now I can increase my margins if I go on a thirty, or I can decrease my margins if I go on a fifteen. But you know, I. And that's 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 a very personal thing, whether you buy on a 15 year mortgage or a 30 year mortgage. Uh, I'm 49 years old. So, you know, I'd like some properties paid off by the time I'm uh, 65. But the reality is, if I'm really going to aggressively grow a portfolio, I'm better off going with 30s because in that same amount of time in the 15 years, it'll take for me to get that thing paid off. In that same amount of time, if I take that extra cash flow that I get by being on a 30, I can actually go out and buy anywhere from four to seven more homes with that one house than if I simply put it on a 15 year mortgage and tried to get that thing or, you know, sought to pay that off in the 15 years. Yeah. So, yeah. and that, and then my net result is my net cash flow 15 years from today. If I have continued to take all of my positive net monthly cash flow from those properties, reinvest them into buying more properties. I actually am many times better off in 15 years in terms of net positive cash flow because I'm now getting cash flow on somewhere between four and seven properties versus one that's paid off. 
Which and do you and focus do mostly right now on multifamilies or single families? I'm primarily single family. I can get better returns right now on single family. Uh, yeah, that's a that you know the it, it's a tough one because I think from a desirability standpoint, if you're trying to leverage yourself into a market where which home is going to rent first, is it the two bedroom, two bath single family residence home, or is it the duplex, tri, or quad? And in terms of you know, when I was in college, I, I lived in rental spaces and I sure as heck would pick a house over sure having neighbors right on top of me. So, you know, whenever we have those conversations, I know there's an awful lot of folks who push the multifamily and I don't, I'm, I'm a multifamily fan, but I like multi, I mean, look at Grant Cardone. Yeah. He's done well with it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's absolutely a great way to go. But sure. in terms of creating a bulletproof portfolio for future stuff, people are always going to want to go to your house first. So if if the market got super nuts in the rental world, and it, and it didn't during the da last downturn, right? Rents didn't really go down in the last downturn. No. They stuck for a while, but they and didn't And then they went down. up dramatically. And then they went up dramatically. Before uh, prices went up. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, over right. the last three years, they've outpaced the appreciation of homes, which has been ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, but in any event, it's it's one of those deals where I'd much rather have a more desirable home so I could charge the same rent as that guy doing a triplex, but at least I get the rent as opposed to the other guy getting the rent. If that, or even charge 10 bucks more or 50 bucks more or whatever it is and know my assets are going to be coming in. So I just thought I'd see if you have, so do you, can, do you have a diversified portfolio at all? Or are you all in for single family residential? I've got a, I mean, I own, I own a couple of commercial buildings that my businesses operate out of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got our, our single family. We, we don't have a lot of multifamily right now. We, we have in the past. We probably will again in the future. Um, but right now we're pretty focused on because I can get really good returns. My cash on cash return, my ROI, my net, my net ROI yeah. uh, are better on single family. Uh, and if you look at Wall Street, what is Wall Street buying right now? Wall single Street's family. buying single family, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, and, and they are now, they are now taking such a stake in, I mean, they're buying literally thousands and thousands and thousands of homes every single month across the country, which some would argue, especially if that's 25% of the marketplace, that's having an impact on the longevity of this, of this bull run. And, yeah. and so it's, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the coming years. Now, some, and I'm, I'm not saying this, but there are those conspiracy theorists out there that would suggest that, hey, part of the reason why interest rates are going up is because, the, you know, the, the powerful few want to outprice the mom and pop and make it so that the hedge funds can go in and buy these things. They're, they're paying cash for them, right? Yeah. And so the, the hedge funds can now, they can go in and buy up those properties. doesn't matter what interest rates do, but they want to get those properties while rate or, or while prices are still relatively affordable. Yeah. Um, so... Who knows what's going to happen in the next five years, but that's not what matters. What matters is what do we need to do, right? Right. We can't, no, none of us has a crystal ball, but I'll tell you that in the last 30 plus years of doing this, I've been very fortunate. Every time we've gone through these different cycles, I've been very fortunate to come out on the top end of these cycles. And the number one reason I believe oh, there's, there's really two things that I subscribe to. One is control the controllables. So I'm only worried about what I can personally control. And then number two is where there's chaos, there's opportunity. Yeah. So when the chaos comes, you got to be ready for and be looking for what is the opportunity in the chaos? Don't panic like everybody else, like Warren Buffett says, right? When everybody else is bearish, I'm bullish. When everybody else is bullish, I'm bearish. Yeah. Right? And so if short sales come back and, he, and here's the reality of the situation, some are saying, well, you know, we may see appreciation, who knows at some point, whether it's this year, next year, 10 years from now, some somewhere down the line, there's going to be a major price adjustment. Much mm -hmm. like in Canada, it's, it's experiencing right this minute. Yeah. When that happens, if I bought my home today and a year from now, I want to sell my home, I've got roughly 8 to 10% cost in selling. So if it did not appreciate at least 8 to 10%, I'm a short sale. Because at the end of the day, I owe more money on my house than I can sell it for and pay everybody. Yeah. And so if that happens, how do I deal with that? That's the big question. Or how do I, you asked the question earlier, how do I prevent myself from being in that position ever? Yeah. And there's only one sure way to do that. Can you guess what that is? Well, I, I would guess just having enough cash to, to weather a period of time, which has kind of always been my mantra for, for my buyers that are way overextending themselves. You know, you're, you're better off buying a little less house and have a little more cash 
um, perhaps if some bad thing is going to happen. So you are hundred percent on the right track. So we have to learn to live on less than we make. So I would recommend a book to everybody. It's uh, it's a very, it's an old book. Uh, it's, it's a great, it's, it's the Bible of money, in my opinion, and it's called The Richest Man in Babylon. Uh, and I'd recommend that everybody read that book. And what you've got to do is you've got to learn to live on less than you make. I mean, because the reality is, you know, f- there was a period of time in your life where you did, you said to yourself, man, if I just made what I what you're now making today, if I just made that amount of money, man, I'd be just I'd be in great shape. Yeah. And yet here we all are, we're making that amount of money. And guess what's happened? Our lifestyle has increased to match our income. And that amount of money is no longer the goal. Now we've got a bigger goal because we want to be able to expand our lifestyle. The key is reduce the lifestyle, right? Simplify the lifestyle, get rid of unnecessary expenses. Things like lattes, you know, four bucks or five bucks a latte. I don't even know what a latte costs nowadays. Like 590? Five now. Okay. So there you go. So let's just say even just five as a, as a former right? Starbucks addict. Oh, well, there you go. Okay. So let's just say, okay, let's just take $5 and 90 cents times five a week. That's 29 a week times 52 weeks a year. That's $1,534 right there. Yeah. So now if I could take that $1,534 and I could find other things like that. And instead of spending it there, if I would set that money aside and I'd go out and I'd develop number one, write this down, I need to have six to 12 months worth of expenses in the bank. Yeah. And so if I can get to my six to 12 months worth of expenses, in the bank, hallelujah, I'm good, right? Like I'm, I'm not stressed out. I can live a very relatively stressful life, at least in terms of finances. Next, I want to start setting some money aside to buy investment properties. Now this is pre- presuming that I've already paid off my debt, right? I don't have consumer debt and that sort of thing. Right. Um, but I want to, I want to set if, and if I do have some consumer debt, I still need to set some money aside for investing while I'm paying that debt off. Um, but I would suggest be aggressive on getting debt free, set some money aside and set, and start investing in real estate uh, while living on less than you make. And guess what? You don't need to worry about being a short sale. Yeah, no, exactly right. And it's, you know, it, people don't realize how much just a little preparation today, to your point of even just starting to put aside some amount of money and my, my encouragement to my clients when I talk to them, it's, a, and it's, it's a little bit, it, sometimes it's super encouraging, because I'll talk to someone who's right on the ball there. Yeah, you know, well, you know, I take X amount, and I put it in the bank every month. And if I can't do that, I don't do whatever's preventing me from doing that. Um, and then you get other folks who just sort of live paycheck to paycheck. And when I help those folks get into a house, one of my first bits of advice is you need to start banking some money. Um, you, you, not, not just because of your house, but because if you want to make sure and keep this house, if something bad happens, you want to have enough money to hold on to it. Um, it doesn't always make me the most popular guy in the room to have that conversation with someone as they're trying to buy a house. But I feel like you, you kind of have, a, if I owe someone a fiduciary duty, <laughs> it extends to the repercussions of potentially buying this house. That's and right. it's, it, 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 the thing was the number of, and that, you know, in my, in terms of my business, the repeat business, I got so many were people I told in the early two thousands, don't do this. Don't get this 110% loan. I really don't think this is a good idea. I had some who took my advice and some who didn't, but boy, the ones who uh, didn't take my advice sure did remember my name and uh, came back and said, boy, do we wish we'd listened to you? How can you help us now? Uh, kind of a thing. And it, it just takes that little ounce of prevention, that little ounce of forethought to believe, you know, on an infinite timeline, all things are possible. Uh, and, and even in just a relatively short timeline, bad things are still possible. Um, and if you're not getting a raise of over 7% every year, you're, you're not beating inflation, you're, you're losing money every year. So you need to start saving some of that cash for your for future stuff. 100%. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you mentioned, you know, you talk about people that have come back into your life or, you know, that you've given advice to in years past. I had one uh, recently. I was at the Pike Place Market in Seattle, Washington. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was I was hosting some clients there that, uh, you know, we were we were taking them around the market and had a little mastermind going with some of our real estate agent clients. And as we were doing this, we were, we were at the gum wall. I don't know if you've ever been to the Pike Place Market, but there's this wall where everybody sticks together. It's really gross. It's nasty. Yeah. But we're standing there. We're all doing our little thing at the gum wall. It's a tradition in Seattle. And, and uh, this guy walks up to me 
and he looked familiar, but I re- I didn't recognize him. I couldn't remember who, exactly who he was at first because he, his his appearance had changed a little bit. I can, you know, he had some facial hair he didn't have before or vice versa. And anyway, long story short, he says, Michael. I'm like, hey, hi, <laughs> how are you? He's like, Michael, I don't know if you remember me, but my, my name's Derek. And dude, let me just tell you, like you changed my life. And here my clients are all standing around and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I, I, I don't remember who this guy is. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do here? And he says, he says, Michael, you changed my life. He says, you got me living on less than I made. You got me setting money aside and you got me investing in real estate. And here we are. And it's been about 20 years since, since I helped him start doing that. We had, a, that's how Club Wealth started. We, were, we mm-hmm. helped mom and pop learn how to invest in real estate, right? And he says, today I've got a whole bunch of properties paid off and I'm here with my two kids and I don't have to work. I get to, I get to be with my family. I get to enjoy my life because I lived on less than I made 20 years ago. And today I can do whatever I want to do. Man, and, and, and then, and then it all came back to me and and it flooded back. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, I know who this is now. I remember Derek and, and it just, but, but I didn't even know how to respond. Like it I was so struck by what he had to say and and you know you talked a minute ago about how how you can accomplish anything given enough time and i think people vastly overestimate what they can do in the short term and vastly underestimate what they can do in the long term yeah but it starts with i've got to be willing to make short-term sacrifices and short term is five years let's just say five years if we could get everyone that's watching this right now to just say okay i'm gonna i'm gonna cut back in every area i can for five years and I'm going to work extra. I'm going to put the extra time in at work. I'm going to work overtime. I'm going to get a second job. I'm going to create a side business, a side hustle, something. I'm going to do something to create some additional revenue so that during this next five years, I can start buying investment properties and real estate. It will not take you long at all before you'll have more coming in in passive income than it takes to pay your bills every month. Yeah. And when that happens, you're out of the rat race. You can retire. Yeah, and then yeah. you can, now you've got your time back. Now you can take that time and you can magnify that time even further to go out and do more of that investing that creates that passive cash flow. Yeah. Yeah. It's recognizing that you're not powerless, right? You, you, yeah. There, there are so many systems in place. It seems like to convince you that all of your success, everything that you get in life needs to come from somewhere else. And the reality is that that's not it. And, and, yeah. and nobody who's truly quote unquote successful, however you define it, that's not how they got it. They didn't get mm-hmm. it by working for some gigantic Fortune 500 company, or, or, or uh, unless you started with Apple in 1991, that's the exception. Uh, that, that stock went crazy. But anyway, and as someone who worked for Apple for a couple of years and got some stock, I'm pretty happy about that. Or but anyway. Microsoft, they did do well too. But, or Microsoft, and there's, sure. there's those tough companies, but to your point, go ahead. Yeah, you're right. Well, no, I'm, I'm just, just, just the point is, is that, that nobody need it. The success is, is, of your, is your own creation, right? Um, and being un- and understanding a you can own it and b no one else is going to stop you no matter no matter what peddler of depression is out there spewing this idea that someone's keeping you down there aren't enough of them to actually do it uh, there may be someone out there who hates your guts and doesn't want you to succeed guess what the best revenge is showing them how great you're going to succeed by devoting some time and effort into whatever it is that you love or enjoy or whatever gives you some satisfaction that's going to make you make you some additional money. So and I, I embrace the haters. They fuel me 100%. Oh, yeah. I, I love it. And, you know, but to, to your point, you know, motivation has got to come from within, you know, and, and everybody's got an excuse. There's always an excuse. Oh, I'm too tired. I got to work too late. I'm too broke. I'm too whatever. The reality is, you know, as I was uh, one, of, one of my mentors is a guy named Jim Rohn or was a guy named Jim Rohn, a wonderful guy. Um, and as I was, I was listening to something of Jim Rohn's recently, and he was talking about, uh, this guy that had a, a gold mine and he says, Hey, I've got this gold mine. I got this, this, this more gold than I know what to do with. And I just don't have time to harvest it all myself. Call, he said, you know, he wants to share it with his friend. So he calls his friend up and he says, Hey, Hey friend, come on over and, and, uh, and, and dig yourself some gold out of my, out of my gold mine here. And, and the friend says, but, but I don't have a shovel. And, and he says, well, we'll go get you one. And the friend says, man, do you, do you know what they're charging for shovels nowadays? <laughs> yeah. 
And it's like, dude, you've got to get out of your own way. Like yeah, at yeah. some point in time, you've got to decide that you're going to take control of your life, take control of your future and make a decision to move forward. Because if you don't, nobody's going to do it for you. Nobody's yeah. going to show up and say, hey, here's a whole bunch of money. Good luck. Yeah. And if they do, don't, don't take it. Like, I mean, that's, that's the worst thing you have to, you know, it's funny. Um, Bill Gates, you know, we're talking about computers, you know, billionaires, Bill Gates was asked in an interview decades ago from this young lady. She says, well, Bill, how did, how did you succeed? And Bill pulls out his checkbook and he, and he writes her name on a check signs the check, tears the check out, hands it to her, gives her the pen, says, fill in the amount. She says, oh, no, I couldn't possibly, I, I couldn't possibly do that. So she pushes the check back to Bill and Bill says, no, 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 really. Fill in whatever amount you want. Oh, no, 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 I couldn't possibly do that. And she pushes it back to Bill and Bill looks at her and he says, as he's putting the check back in his pocket, he says, the secret to my success is I never miss an opportunity. Yeah. And how many people right now watching your call right now, how many people watching this podcast would say to themselves, I wish I would have bought a rental property five years ago, yeah. 10 years ago, when I was in my 20s, whenever. Everybody was telling people? you real estate will never come back, right? Um, because on the flip side of that whole, people who will discourage your success or tell you you need it to come from somewhere else, you know, there's, there's going to be people out there that want to help nurture your success, but nobody cares as much about your success as you do. Right. I mean, even you as the guy who contributes to people being successful, yeah. you're, you're offering people tools, advice, processes, but the bottom line is that individual who's receiving that needs to care the most because they need to implement it. And it's if I want you to be successful more than you want to be successful, we both have a problem. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. And we also have someone who's likely going to be on welfare in the short term. So I mean, that, that's, that's not a, that's not a viable option. I think for, for most folks, um, dude, I, I don't know if you can tell already, but I'm a hand up, not a handout kind of guy. Yeah. So yeah. 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 And it's, it's the classic, right? It's the, do you yeah. give the guy a fish or do you teach him to fish kind of a thing? Yeah. And, and at that point it becomes how good of a fisherman are you? You know, how, how far do you take your skills? Do you figure out the best parts of the stream to drop your lure? What, you know, what, what's your bait, you know, the, the things that you figure out because you're doing it. Um, and I, I, we've kind of descended into this raw, raw place that I think is important, <laughs> but uh, in terms of, and we've talked about responsible, you know, borrowing and responsible spending and living within your means below your means so that you can save what, what other kinds of advice would you give given what the market's doing right now what advice would you throw out there that we haven't talked about yet buy for cash flow and forget it and what i mean by that is you know it's, it's like don't be the day trader of real estate those yeah. are the ones that are going to get burned what, what you need to do is you need to buy and hold long term and and when you have it forget it and don't worry if the price goes down you only lose if you sell yeah that's why you buy for cash flow. If it's constantly throwing off cash flow every month and, and, and the price goes in, let's say I bought the property for $200,000 and I'm, I'm getting $500 a month in positive monthly cash flow after I pay my mortgage and all the expenses associated with owning this rental property, I get $500 a month in positive cash flow, but the price drops. All of a sudden the market tanks and the price drops and now it's only worth $150,000. Well, what do I do? You don't the answer sell is nothing. You keep it. You yeah. keep you keep collecting your five hundred dollars a month positive cash flow, and then guess what you do? You go out and you buy another one. Now yeah. instead of paying the two, maybe you're paying one fifty. Great, that's called dollar cost averaging, right? Worst case scenario, you're leveraging your money. You go out and you buy another one, and eventually it'll go up in value, and that's great if it does, and it's fine if it doesn't, because what will happen is the rent will go up over time. You'll be paying down that mortgage, or better yet, your tenant will be paying down that mortgage. You'll be getting tax deductions. And I got a massive tax deduction this year. Why? Because of all these rental properties. I mean, I'm telling you, it was a massive yeah. tax deduction. And you know what I did with that tax deduction? I didn't go on vacation. I didn't go buy a new car. I didn't go buy a bigger house. What did I do? I went out and bought more rental properties. Yeah. Someone That's asked me, I picked up a client once and they, 
It was the weirdest conversation I've had in a long time. I don't drive a Mercedes. I don't drive a Range Rover. I, I, I drive a Ford. Um, I've driven the same Ford for 10 years. Uh, I take very good care of my car. And someone asked me, well, how come you're not driving around in a Mercedes or a BMW? And I said, because I'd rather invest that money in a house mm -hmm. uh, than a car. Uh, you know, so, uh, well, you know, our, 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 as if that's some measure, you're, the measure of success for me is smart decisions. So, so if you're driving around in a $270,000 car, I'm not sure that's that's a, a good thing for, for me in terms of gauging your ability to, to wisely invest your money. But, you know, you hit on a couple of things over this last you know, 30 minutes we've been talking. There, there's the, the one reality is particularly in my area, it's super difficult in the Silicon Valley for someone to jump into investing because the median house price is $1.7 million. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll take, I end up doing very long drives out to the Central Valley to like Fresno and Sacramento and other places where homes are more affordable. But I'm someone who embraces the idea of you don't have to buy in your local area to find the right property, you just need to assemble the right people to guide you through the process in other markets to make wise investments outside of your state. Um, I, don't, I and live in the, Seattle. Internet I don't today, buy here. It, yeah. So I'd love to get your thoughts on that. And maybe if you're willing to uh, give some inside confidential information, what are communities you think would make great investments anywhere in the country today? Sure. Okay, well, for starters, you're right. I don't buy in Seattle. I'm, I'm not buying, really, I'm not buying anywhere on the West Coast just yeah, because yeah. the numbers don't work, right? Yeah. Uh, and so where am I buying primarily? I'm buying in the Midwest, uh, buying in the Southwest, I'm buying in the South, uh, you know, places like Tennessee, uh, Florida. Uh, see, the, everyone listening, see, he said Tennessee. I, oh, I'm, yeah. uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee has been on my list because uh, they a few years back, they did the whole fiber thing. And a huge tech influx happened. And I'm like, buy, buy Chattanooga, baby. But right near the river, buy Chattanooga. Well, if you're, if you're looking for a great real estate agent in Chattanooga, one of our, one of our top coaching clients is the top agent in Chattanooga. I seriously uh, would like to get his name uh, and yeah, contact she, info once we're done. So She will take very good care of you. She's amazing. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so I'll definitely get you their info. Um, but at the end of the day, Tennessee's a great investment. I, I know uh, my son, he bought his first rental property down in Memphis, and uh, it was a duplex. Uh, and you know, he, and he's owned it for about a year and a half now. And he's made, uh, actually almost two years now, I think. And he's made, I think a $70,000 profit on appreciation, not to mention the cash flow he's had during that period of time, the tax deductions he's enjoyed. Uh, and he's just now getting ready to do a 1031 on that one. So he can roll that $70,000 into a bigger, better property mm -hmm. that he can now get greater appreciation and greater cash flow on. Um, but I mean, that, that's a great example or, you know, Florida, pretty much all over Florida has been doing really well. Yeah. Uh, we're buying a lot in Chicago. We're buying, uh, Wisconsin. We're buying Kentucky. Um, are you uh, buying coastal in Florida or are you going a little bit more inland? Honestly, I couldn't even tell you. I don't okay. even know where our stuff is in Florida. Uh, okay. I want to say Pensacola is one of the places we're buying, but I, but I, I don't, I don't remember where all the places we're buying in Florida are. Um, so, and, and that's, and by the way, people think, man, how can this guy not know where he's buying? How can this guy not be looking at all these properties? Listen, you've got to, you've got to get the right people around you and you got to trust them who they are. You got to, you got to trust them. You got to trust that they know what they're doing. Now in the beginning, if it's at all humanly possible, I highly recommend buying your investment properties close to where you live, right? If you can make them cash flow, if you can drive to go see it, it's a lot easier to make mistakes when you can drive to go see them than it is to get on a plane. I'm fortunate that I'm in a financial position where I'm free to go invest in all kinds of different markets around the country. And I've got people and resources in those markets that make it easy for me to do so with relative assurity and security that I'm not going to be getting myself into a major problem. And if I do, I've got the people there to take care of it. Yeah. Um, and, and so if you don't have that, yes, it's obviously better to, to invest close to home. Um, but if I'm in Silicon Valley, I mean, what am I, what's my best, my, for my, and, and there's this debate about, you know, is your personal residence an investment or not? And the reality is it's an expense, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're paying money every month. You're not making many money every month. So it's an expense. Now, if I lived in Silicon Valley, you want to know what I would do? I'd buy forego. outside of Silicon Valley. Well, that or I'd forego the house and I'd go buy a fourplex. 
Yeah. And because I can finance a fourplex as a residential property and the bank will let me qualify for a lot more as on an investment property than it can on a personal property. So let's say I can only afford, you know, a pretty normal little three bedroom, two bath house in Silicon Valley is probably what a million, million and a half, something like uh, that. One, about 1.5. Okay. So let's say it's 1.5. So instead of buying that $1.5 million house that I barely qualify for, I could go out and I could get a loan. I could talk to a lender and I'll bet I could get a lender to give me a loan for two and a half to three and a half on a fourplex because they're going to credit 75% of the, of the presumed income from that property. They'll do rental research and figure out what they think it's going to get. And they'll give you 75% credit for that plus your income. Now you qualify for more. You live in one of those units and you rent the other three out. Yeah. That's how you get started. Yeah. Now you start doing that and you can start putting money to work for you now. And, and that would be a much better move than buying across the country to start with. Yeah. Because now I can do it in my local market and I can make the numbers work. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of house hacking. I mean, it's yeah. when I talk to either even first time buyers who are maybe a little bit hesitant. Uh, I'm, I'm, and you make a really good point because even your example of saying, you know, if the average house is going for 1.5 million bucks, go to 2.5 and do a duplex that, that isn't even the amount you'd have to go to. I mean, you could buy a duplex or a quad, uh, in a lot of different communities for only 10%, 20% over what you would buy that single family residential home for. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're in terms of value per housing unit duplexes and tries and quads are amazing deals even at the crazy areas in palo alto where they're going for three and a half million four million bucks well here's here's what i like about that i i would prefer if i had a choice between a, a two or a fourplex right i would go to the fourplex why because i spread my risk out over yeah. four units and i can get into more real estate right so again and if i can if i if if and again, you got to look at the numbers. You got to make sure the numbers work. But just let's just assume for a moment that my cost to live there is not going to change based on whether I do the duplex or the fourplex. Well, then go for the fourplex, get by as much as you can yeah. with as little as possible out of pocket. Because instead of like, I have to pay, you know, 15, 20% on my investment properties that I buy in most parts of the country because of the number of properties I own, because I'm buying them as investment properties. When you buy that fourplex, you can buy it owner occupied because you're going to live in one of the units. Yeah. So now you're three, three and a half to 5% down. Yeah. I mean, you're saving a ton of money on that down payment and you can still get cash flow. And if you're buying it right, you're probably paying a lot less to live there than you would to buy, live in that house. And now instead of gaining appreciation and tax benefits on a million and a half, maybe you're gaining it on three, $4 million, man. That's a huge, I mean, think about this. If, if, if historically let's just use 3% as our number, right? If, if the historic appreciation of the last hundred years, and I think it's more than 3%, but let's just call it 3%, Yeah. 3%. So one, one a million and a half, I'm just doing some quick math here, uh, uh, times 3%. Well, that's $45,000 a year, but watch this. What if I'm, what if I've got a $3 million property? Well, now I've got $90,000 a year coming in on appreciation alone. Yeah, then you yeah. start adding the tax benefits. The fact that my mortgage is now getting paid down on that property. It's a no brainer. Yeah. So, no, I'm with you. And yeah. it's, and the more, the one thing that's those, those units are, are kind of thin on the ground around here um, in terms of particularly um, attractive quads. I mean, many of the quads I see are just, ghetto the, well it's, it's, it's just yeah not or, the problem is so many of them were built so long ago you just yeah. nobody builds them anymore around here uh, but you know i have several clients just over the last year that did exactly what you're describing where they still couldn't afford doing right here in the heart of silicon valley but in in areas within that 40 minute commute range uh were able to find stuff and and they're 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 still positive cash flow even though they're living in one of the units so once they move on and they're planning on doing that in three years, they're going to move into a new, they're going to buy another tri or quad or duplex. Yep. And then suddenly they'll have positive cash flow of nearly $2,000 a month on that one What's property. What's really nice about that though, is they can do that every year. One time every year you can move and buy another owner occupied property every year. And you think about those guys, right? When they, so when they rent that one that they've been living in out, mm -hmm. So they're already cash positive on that. Product. So now they're getting all of the cash flow from unit number four that they can now use to save up for the next down payment. Oh my gosh. I mean, yeah. 
There's so many ways for them to make money yeah. on that. I, I had a guy who was just a solo individual and his way of doing it was um, <laughs> he'd go and he'd live in it for a year. Then he'd move out and rent it and live in an RV for a year so that he'd get the cash flow out of the <laughs> that fourth unit. And the, then he'd buy his next one. It was, the thing he's got to watch out for on that is the banks would consider that mortgage fraud. So he's got to be pretty careful. Well, he makes sure to stay in it long enough that he's established that they're beyond okay. that point of fraud. Yeah. That, so gotcha. he, he lives there for like a year, year and a half, two years. Oh, perfect. It is. Yeah. Then he's good. Yeah. 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 No, and, he, and that, that, that was my advice. I'm like, you can't, you can't yeah. do this. And a month later move out because that's Correct. fraud and you'll go to jail yeah. and that's not good. Absolutely. Yeah. No, but that's fantastic. If he's living there for at least a year. Right. And then he's yeah. moving into that, that uh, RV. Yeah, well, he was also now a contractor kind of guy, so he'd go in there and he'd fix up the place super nice, so he could rent it for the max once he once he decided. To that's do it, huge. So. Yeah. Well, that's what you want to look for too. Is you want to look for places where you can do a little bit to add a lot of value, right? You yeah. know, can I add carports, for example? It's pretty cheap to add carports, but it can really increase the value of that yeah. of that rental because or turn carports into garages. I had a guy do that, and he was able to increase his monthly rent by by one hundred and fifty bucks per unit. Per unit. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Now you start talking 150 bucks per unit, you know, to us, that might sound like a small number, but man, you, you know, you start talking 150 bucks times 12, that's $1,800 per year. Well, let's say that's on a four times block, three, because he did it for three units. Oh, sorry. Okay. So divided by four, hold on. So that was 1800 times three, that's $5,400 per year. Right. And so now if I do that, let's say for five years, that brings me to $27,000. That gives me enough for another down payment on another little place that I'm going to go owner occupy. Yeah. I mean, and so you, you, you really you just, you got to put the mechanics of this to work for you. So everybody that's watching this right now is capable of retiring wealthy in 15 years. Problem is everybody wants to do it in five. Yeah. But the, the thing is, if you're focused on the five and you're not worried about the 15, then you'll never get to the 15 the way you want to. So what you've got to do is you got to decide where's my hard going to be. Is it going to be hard now or hard in 15 years? Yeah. Because it's going to you're, there's going to be a suck somewhere. Is it going to yeah, suck yeah. now or is it going to suck in 15 years? I'd rather have it suck now in 15 years from now. I can do whatever the heck I want to do. Yeah. Always embrace that. the proximal suck. That that yeah. is. That is the way to go. Embrace the proximal suck. I've never heard that day. before. I love yeah. that. Yeah. It's whatever's the closest suck. Just deal with it and move on. As soon as, the sooner down. you start it, the sooner you'll finish it. Embrace so. the proximal suck. <laughs> Dude, I am so using that. I am completely stealing that from you. Just just make sure to keep the reference to where you got I'll, it. I'll, I'll, I'll give you credit for you for, to, for, to you for the first couple of times. Then, then, then it'll at least be yours. Yeah, okay. I can live with that. <laughs> All right, where well, I can see we're creeping up on what you told me was your hard stop. So I, would, I don't want to drag you any further than you promised. It, you, you've, you've really been generous with your knowledge and I really appreciate it. Um, if you've got any parting words for the, for the folks, if you've got anything coming up that you'd like people to be aware of, just this would be the perfect time to share it. You know, I've got nothing to sell to mom and pop homeowner out there. If you're a real estate agent, you know, get on clubwealth.com, reach out to us. We'll help you out. Um, we do have a Facebook group for investors. that's um, not very active, to be honest with you. It's a small group, but, it, you know, but I do answer questions in there from time to time. Uh, so you can go to, it's a club, club wealth real estate investor group on Facebook. Uh, but, but truth be told, look, here's the, here's all I would say. Here's the, here's the advice that I would give you guys. Start living on less than you make. Start squirreling away as much as you can every month until you can find a way to get into that duplex, triplex, fourplex that we talked about. Yeah. Get into that and continue to live well below your means and just keep repeating, rinsing and repeating that process every as often as humanly possible. And over time, you will be surprised at how quickly you'll develop your net worth and you'll have financial freedom that we all crave. So. I think that's great advice, you know, and it's, it's like all good advice. You need to take it and you need to run with it. Uh, don't just let it sit there. So everyone out there, I hope that you've, that you've gotten something out of today's exchange. Uh, I know that uh, given, given what we're, where I think we're heading, it's, it, maybe it's just a degree of severity. Embracing that philosophy, I think is going to go a long way towards making it a blip in your life rather than a cliff. Uh, that you have to, to have to navigate. So thanks again to Michael for sharing so much of his time with him. He's been super generous. Uh, thanks again for visiting. And at some point in the future, I'd love to talk to you again. Sounds great. Thanks a lot, Robert. You bet. All right, folks. I hope as always, we have left more value on the table. 
than we have taken up in your time. That's always the goal here. So hopefully you feel like you've learned something new. I think that Michael's perspective is interesting on these things. Now, Club Wealth is definitely aimed at real estate agents. So if you are a real estate agent and you are looking at upping your game, I think Club Wealth is a worthwhile option for you to consider. Uh, And of course, for everyone out there who's doing real estate, who is serving the needs of buyers, sellers, and investors, never forget that the key is going to be to provide the best possible service and always understand what that is. Measure yourself by what your clients should measure you by and keep that other stuff between you and your broker. No one cares or should care about all that other miscellaneous stuff. Uh, But becoming a good and successful agent is a perfectly reasonable goal. Just never lose sight of the fact that it's about serving the needs of your clients. All right, folks, thanks again for listening. I hope y'all... Got some good info out of that. Thanks again for listening. Talk to y'all next time.